Good morning, everyone. Uh, once again, my name is Kimberly Baroni. I'm the Product Service and Support Coordinator here at Psychology Software Tools. Uh, very happy to have everybody join us. Also, if any questions come up after the session today, we strongly encourage you to please email us at support at pstnet.com. Whether it's a question specific to something we reviewed in this webinar or anything about implementing experiments in ePrime at all, please, please don't hesitate to contact us. Uh, and also wanted to make a quick note that we have a variety of uh, social media channels that we communicate on. So if you're partial to uh, any of these channels, then um, please go ahead and follow us for the latest information. We're going to jump right into what I'd like to get done today, which is to first build a simple two choice reaction time task uh, in about 40 minutes. Uh, I'm assuming that you have some interest in experiment authoring tools in general. You may have a little bit of experience with ePrime. You may have no experience with ePrime. We are going to go pretty quick, but we're truly going to cover the basic process from start to finish to create an experiment from scratch. The task is simple. This is a two choice reaction time task. There will be two stimuli presented on the screen for each trial. And the task is simply for the participant to indicate if the items are similar or dissimilar. We're going to go ahead and present stimuli in two modalities. The stimuli are either going to be presented as text, so simply a word, for example, the word pair happy and pleased, or we're going to present images. The images I'm using today are certainly not anything you're likely to use in this type of uh, similarity rating task, but I wanted to illustrate some of the graphic resources that are made available uh, as part of ePrime. And so we're using today some playing cards and this these graphics show uh, just two of the playing cards that we distribute as part of ePrime. The larger point is to illustrate both uh, the ability to present stimuli again in a variety of modalities. So we'll be doing text and images. And the dependent metrics we're going to log our response time and uh, the actual response itself, whether they said it was similar or dissimilar. So pretty basic task. Uh, but talking about basics, just to make sure we're starting from the same page, what exactly is ePrime? It's a suite of software tools the three primary applications in the suite are the eStudio application, which is used to author or edit an existing experiment. The eRun application, which is designed for running an experiment that's been authored and compiled in eStudio and collect your data file. And then lastly, eDataAid, which is a tool that allows you to construct quick descriptive statistics for example, a quick table of mean RT by condition, and also to easily export either your raw data or mean data for analysis in your favorite data analysis tool. There are other software applications in the East Prime suite, but these are the primary ones, and most of our time today will be spent in eStudio. eStudio is a GUI with experiment-like objects that represent your experiment design. The primary objects that we'll be working with today are lists, which are used to define the, the stimuli that vary on each trial. Text and slide objects that are used to present information to the participant. You can present text, images, sound, and movies to the screen. And then procedures, which are used to define the repeating structures of the experiment. For example, a trial is likely to present uh, the, re the same repeating elements. A simple experiment might be a fixation, a stimulus display, and a feedback. Every single trial or most of the trials, you're going to present that sequence of events. 
And then you might have a block manipulation where you're grouping those trials. So maybe one block is asking you to uh, use a particular set of responses and you're changing that for the second block or you're varying the instructions or you're varying the specific list that you're showing. These are the primary elements that we'll be looking at. The number one tip to stress for anybody who's uh, new to E-Prime is that E-Prime is not PowerPoint. You are not creating a separate entity for each unique object that needs to be displayed. For example, if you have a total of 100 stimuli, you're not going to have 100 objects in your experiment. You'll put the information that varies on the list, and then you'll build this simple structure that gets repeated. And you'll see what I mean in just a moment. Uh, number one, a tip is to think of your experiment procedurally. What elements stay the same and what elements vary? All right. With that said, I would like to immediately launch into eStudio and get going on our task. So what I've just done now is launch the eStudio application. The very first thing that happens is you get this prompt. Would you like to use one of the existing templates below? And this is one of the tips I'm going to reinforce, which is to go ahead and start with one of these templates because it gets a lot of the basic structure in place for you. The eStudio application presents this experiment explorer window, which is the main structure of your experiment. The toolbox over here represents the objects that you can drag over into the GUI to build the structure of your experiment. And this area was populated when I selected the basic template. We're going to go ahead and expand the full experiment. So you'll see that there clearly is a hierarchical nature to this. So right out of the gate, I have an existing structure where I have a session procedure that's going to present an instruction screen, sample, rows from a list of block stimuli and run a block procedure where I have some trial stimuli that vary. And on every trial, I'm going to present a fixation, a stimulus, and a feedback object. We're going to cycle through that process for all of the exemplars I define on the trial list, and then we're going to say goodbye. That's the basic structure that you get from the using the basic template. Uh, it's not exactly what we need, and we'll have to customize it, but it gets us pretty far along. Now, the first thing I'm going to do is get rid of this feedback object. This is a ratings task, so there is not a correct or an incorrect answer that we're going to present to the participant. So we're going to go ahead and just delete that. That object was removed from our procedure and placed down in the unreferenced e object section. This section you can think of as your temporary trash folder. Often in the course of building an experiment, you're going to be adding things, deleting things, moving things around, temporarily want to get rid of things. One of my tips at the end is to remember to go ahead and delete things out of unreferenced once you've completed your full experiment. But it is like a little um, recycle bin or trash bin. You can temporarily move things in there, but we're not going to be presenting feedback. Also, I've already shared that some of the stimuli we'll be presenting are images. In E-Prime, in order to present images, we use something we call a slide object. This template is set up to use a text object for presenting just plain text, typically fixation, instructions, goodbye, things like that. So I'm going to need a slide and not a text object. So I'm going to hit the delete button again and get rid of that stimulus. What I want to do is drag a slide object over into my procedure. So what I did is uh, hovered over the slide object in my toolbox of objects available and dragged it over to the fixation. Uh, uh, sorry, dragged it over to my trial procedure. 
by default, ePrime eStudio is going to give a unique name to every object. You'll see that it called this slide one. If I did it again, it would make a slide two and so on. That's not particularly helpful to help me understand what's going on in my experiment. So the first thing I want to do is rename this to give me some idea of what the purpose of this object is. And for now, I'm just going to call it stim. I might want to call it stimulus, but each object has to have a unique name in your experiment. And we already have a stimulus object, even though it's an unreferenced. So I'm just going to call that stim. I double click on an object and it opens it up in this area that we refer to as the workspace. A slide object allows you to put multiple pieces of information together. You could put some text with an image, with a movie, uh, various combinations. For now, I just want to build the text portion of the experiment. So on my slide, I want to put two pieces of text up for the two words that I want to compare. I cl click on this slide toolbar here to select a text object and I click over here and that places the text object here on the GUI. I double click here to bring up the properties of that object. And the one I'm going to focus on now is the frame object. So this object is a frame that can be placed anywhere on this workspace. By default, the size and the height are 25% of my available screen. That's what I want to keep with. However, I want to put this first one 25% of the screen to the left and in the middle vertically. And you'll see that that adjusted where that text appeared. I need a second text object for my second word I'm going to put up. And I'm going to keep the defaults for the size, but instead of it being over on the left, I want this to be over on the right, but I also want it to be in the middle. And there's my text. The information that I want to present, though, is simply not the words TEXT on each of these objects. I'm going to present a series uh, of paired words that I've defined. Uh, and where you do that in E-Prime is on a list object. I double clicked on the trial list object. It opened it up in the workspace. By default, this is the simple reaction time task that comes with the basic template. In this task, you're putting up a string and the task is to indicate if um, it's an animal or not. That's not what our experiment's going to be. So we're going to customize this now to put the pairs of words up that we want. Hopefully you have the sense that this list object is very much like an Excel spreadsheet, that you've got rows to represent the unique exemplars. The columns represent all of the information we need to define a trial. We do not have a correct answer, so I'm going to highlight that column and get rid of it. I don't need that. And I'm getting a prompt, do I want to remove the attributes? So our reference to the varying pieces of information on a list are called attributes. Yes, I want to get rid of correct. I don't need it. I am going to need an attribute for the first word. I'm going to call that stim1. And I'm going to need an attribute for my second word. So I'm going to go up here and click on add attribute. And add stim2. These are not the values I want to present though, so I'm going to highlight them and delete them. I have two other attributes I want to include. The first one is going to represent the modality. For now, I'm only presenting the text words, uh, but we all, we'll go back and add the images in later. So I have a modality to consider. And I also have a rating, are the items generally considered to be similar or not? So what I've done so far is just highlight, um, highlight the columns I didn't need to get rid of them and added the columns or the attributes that I need. Now, because everybody who works with me knows that I'm a horrific typist, 
I went ahead and typed up some sample stimuli to use. Uh, so I just put those up in Excel and I'm just going to type in my word, my word pair. So I'm going to have a pair of words, happy and pleased, annoyed and hostile, relaxed and curious, bored and scared. And the category ranking, I'm going to consider the first two to be similar and the last two to be dissimilar. And I forgot to put the modality in when I put that text up, but I can just go ahead and type them in here. So we're going to refer to these as uh, the modality is going to be words. Filling that in. At this point, I've defined four word pairs. I've classified their modality and their category. The last piece I need to do to put all of this together is to now reference the stimuli on the slide that's presenting them. So way to do that. What I've done here is arrange the objects in the workspace so you can see them at the same time. Here I want to present whatever value is in STEM 1. So instead of it being text, I'm going to type the open square brackets and I'm sorry you can't see me typing. But when I do that, that pops up this list. The way that E prime refers to attributes is to put the name of the attribute within square brackets. So when I type the square bracket, E prime popped up all of the attributes that have already been defined for the experiment. Most of these are on the list we just looked at, the category, the modality, STEM 1 and STEM 2. Some of the other ones are ones that E prime brings up by default. For example, you must define a subject number. Uh, but here I want to go ahead and put STEM 1 up. And hopefully you can predict that over here, what I wouldn't want to do is present STEM number 2. So what's going to happen on every trial? Let's go back. At the start of the experiment, E prime is going to present whatever text is on the instructions and there's some default text there. It's going to go into a, our block list, which we hadn't looked at yet. This is a pretty simple block list. It has one row and it says whenever you get to this list, pick a row. There's only one row to pick and run the procedure that's defined there, which is the block proc. The very first thing that happens when the block proc executes is that the trial list appears and E prime needs to select a row. We're keeping things simple for now and keeping the defaults, which are to sample everything in sequential order. There's a wide variety of other sampling options, but it's always a good idea to stick with the defaults and select things in a sequential order when you're first starting and testing your experiment so that before a trial comes up, you already know what to expect E prime to present. You can then confirm it's presenting the stimuli that you expect. And if you're doing a scoring component, that it's scoring them in the way that you expect. So E prime is going to go here and it's going to select a row. Since we're sampling sequentially, again, it's going to pick on the first trial, the first row and say, assign all of these values here to these different attributes. So the value of the STEM1 attribute is happy. The value of the STEM2 attribute is pleased and so on. And then go ahead and run the procedure which is going to put up a fixation and then present the stimulus. We're almost ready to test our experiment, but the last thing I need to do is to configure what responses we're going to collect to this object, how long we want to leave it displayed, and what responses, if any, we want to go ahead and log. This uh, orange object here are the property pages for the entire slide. There's with eStudio, there's usually quite a number of properties that you can configure, which is what gives ePrime its great flexibility to implement a wide variety of, of designs. But for the most part, there's a small set, subset that you'll be dealing with. And the duration and input tab is one of the, the most critical ones. By default, ePrime is going to put up an object for 1,000 milliseconds. The units here are, are default to milliseconds. 
But when you're collecting a response, you often don't want to uh, leave it up for a either that short amount of time or to time it at all. In this particular simple task, I want to leave the display up until the participant makes a response. So for that reason, I'm going to go ahead and change the duration to the default of infinite, which means leave it up until the response that we're about to define uh, is accepted. A response in eStudio is defined as an input mask. We're going to add an input mask, and you'll see here, by default, eProime can accept a response from the keyboard, from a mouse, or from a button. A button is a very powerful GUI element that we introduced as part of eProime 3. We're not going to have time to get into buttons today. Um, but just to keep in the back of your head what buttons represent or what you might think it looks like a visual button on the screen. So if you want the participant to press a button that says left or a button that says correct or whatnot, you can put that element on. For now, we're going to stick with a simple keyboard response. So I've added a keyboard input mask. This field here, allowable, says which keys do you want to allow the participant to press? By default, it accepts any. But we want to restrict that because we want to make sure the participant is actually performing the task that we asked them to and is making a valid response. So the responses we're interested in are either a one or a two. That's arbitrary. That was my decision of the experimenter. I could say the keys Q and P or Z and slash or space mark, whatever I want. But I've chosen right now for my purposes to have a one or two, one for similar, two for dissimilar. If there were a correct answer, this would be the place that you would define what the correct answer was. The time limit property here says, how long are you going to allow them to make a response? In most cases, you want to allow them to respond as long as the object is on the screen. And that's what the defaults allow us to do, and we're going to keep that. If you had a more complicated design, for example, you put up the stimulus for a short amount of time, you then go on to blank the screen or present a mask or to present another piece of information, you may still want to allow them to respond, even though the first stimulus that the response is timed relative to is off the screen. That's where you can change these uh, time limit values, but we're going to keep it the same as duration. Then the last thing we're going to look at uh, is the logging tab. This is the tab that allows us to define what information we want to log. Uh, we're not going to go through all of these different options here, but in general, eStudio and ePrime's approach is going to be log everything. It's much better to possibly need some information and choose not to look at it than it is to want to have some information logged, but you fail to do it. If we had specified a correct answer, eStudio would have said, hey, you defined a correct answer, but you're not logging anything. Usually, if there's a correct answer, we know you want to log it. I don't have a correct answer, so that's why it didn't prompt me, but I can choose here what I want to log. And in this particular case, I would like to log the response that they make. Did they say yes, they were sim did they say similar or dissimilar? And I also want to know what their reaction time is. So I'm just going to click those two boxes boxes and hit the apply button. That's all I have to do to get it to log. The last thing I need to do, uh, and I apologize for having to share this with you, but this is a function of sharing an experiment over a Teams meeting. This is not something you would normally need to do. I need to disable the sound device. What I did here, I know I did that quickly. Let me review that again. I double clicked on this green cube, which brings up all of the properties affiliated with the entire experiment. So this is going to be the highest level set of properties that affect everything in the experiment. The devices tab are all the devices that are enabled by default. Uh, you need to have a display, typically you're putting information on the screen. You can accept information from a keyboard, the mouse, or the button. Sound is also included in that list. When I run an experiment in the environment I'm going to do momentarily and share it with all of you, one of the things eProme does to maintain its high level of timing accuracy is takes control of as many devices on the computer as it can, and that includes the sound card. 
if I were presenting sound in the experiment, you would hear sound as I presented it. But then when the experiment came back, E prime keeps control of that sound. And unfortunately, then you wouldn't be able to hear me anymore. So again, that's a, that's a specific issue, particular to E prime. What I'm going to do now is run the experiment and I'm going to choose to run it in this windowed mode. This is not the way that you would run an experiment once you're actually doing data collection, but test mode or a windowed mode is a very useful tool. If you just want to do a quick test and see what your experiment look like looking like generally. By default, E prime is going to prompt me for a subject number and a session number and give me a chance to confirm that those are indeed the values I want. This is the default text that's programmed on the instruction screen. It's a welcome screen. There's our fixation. That's our first pair of words, and I'm going to press a one. That's our second pair of words. I'm going to press a two. That's our third pair of words. I'm going to press a one again, and our fourth pair of words, and I'm going to press a two. And there we go. So in the annals of experimental psychology, this type of experiment is nothing that's going to do anything to change the field. But literally in about 20 minutes, we really accomplished quite a bit. We built an experiment from scratch. We have a list of exemplars that we're pulling from. We're presenting that information on the screen, collecting responses. So we did all of that in just about 20 minutes. One of the most important tips that I'm going to stress once we're wrapped up is what we're going to talk about right now. You may have noticed there's a little window down here in the GUI called output. When an experiment runs, it generates a data file, right? That's the whole point. We want to log data. And it's very easy to access that data right from um, the eStudio interface. So what I did was double clicked on that EDAT3. And I'm sorry this is difficult to see because the icon is dark. But that opened up the eData8 ED, e application, which is what I have here. Now, there's quite a number of columns, as you can see. This is consistent with our philosophy that we want to log everything you might possibly need uh, rather than fail to log things. So there's a lot of information that's logged. But by scrolling left and right, I can walk through all of the different variables that were logged in the experiment. So my independent dependent variables are columns. My individual rows represent my individual trials. And you can see here trial one, two, three, and four was presented. Over here is my stim one. That was the first word that was presented. Over here is stim word number two. This column here, stim.resp, that represents the response that was made to that specific trial. And if you recall, I did present a, I did select a one followed by a two, and then I did it again, a one followed by a two. And then finally, I have my reaction time. So this is the response from the point at which the stimulus word pair was presented on the screen and when I made my response. It's extremely useful to look at your data to confirm several things. Most importantly, can you find the data that you're interested in? This is obviously a fairly trivial example. It's not hard to imagine when you're collecting additional data, you're doing uh, presenting practice versus experimental trials, you want to be able to differentiate those, perhaps you're collecting more than one response. It's really, really important to make sure that you can confirm the information that's being logged and that you also understand how to access it. So we can't stress enough how useful it is to simply click on that hyperlink that shows up as soon as you've collected a data file and go ahead and check it. In addition, what I'm going to show you now, I think is one of the most underutilized features of eStudio, of, of the ePrime suite. And that's the ability to create a edited version of your data file so that you don't have to look at all these other columns that you're maybe not concerned with. So what I did here was cl click on this arrange columns option. And this gives me a list of all of the columns 
which again are my independent and dependent variables in the data file. And by default, everything is shown. I'm going to remove all of them. I'm going to alphabetize them so they don't have to search through. I want to look at my subject number, my session number, my block number, which is only going to be one in this case, my trial number. Then I want to take a look at the category, the modality, and then finally the actual response and the reaction time. So these are the key ones that I'm interested in. And just by doing that, I get something that is a lot easier to manage. Finally, once you've created a filtered view that allows you to hone in on what you're interested in, you could easily save this. So I selected the save column definition file. I'm gonna call it my basic view. And now anytime I do another test of this, I can open up that column definition file and immediately hone in on what I need to take a look at. It's a really, really great time saver. All right, that process took me uh, probably about five minutes longer than what I wanted to review, but I'm very quickly going to go back to the original experiment and we're gonna go ahead and edit this and add that whole second modality, which is to present the images. And I want to do that for a couple reasons. The main reason is I want to show you how you can expand the utility of a given slide by taking advantage of the slide states. Sometimes users might come to us with this type of design. I'm presenting two different modalities. The my actual critical stimulus display just looks completely different between different trials. And so maybe they would have presented the words on a text object because by default text is a simple way to put up text. But they think I'm gonna create a different slide to present my images because images and words just look very different. That's not a good way to design your experiment because as I hope you saw when we looked at the data file, the log data is relative to the object that presented it. So in this simple example, the stim object, the object name stim is the one collecting the response, and the RT in this case is called stim.rt. The response that they made is called stim.resp. If I somehow tried to introduce a different object in the experiment to present my images, then the responses to that object would be logged in a different set of columns. So in essence, I would be collecting two different sets of dependent variables, which is going to make comparison of those extremely difficult. Using different slide states allows you to present very different stimuli, depending on your condition, while collecting every dependent metric under the same set of column names. And that's what we're going to do here. By default, a slide is going to have a single state. I'm not sure how well you can see this, but here, this uh, slide state is represented by the name state one. We're going to go ahead and change that, and we're going to use the modality column, the modality value to define the state that we want to present. So first thing I'm going to do is rename this to words. We're going to call this the word state. I'm now going to create a new slide state. And I right clicked here to get the slide state sum menu to come up. And I said add a slide state. So now I have another blank slide state, which should look pretty similar um, to the to the uh, to the original one. You can zoom in and zoom out at different levels, depending on whether you want to hone in on a very precise section or a larger section. So I just zoomed in to make it similar to the first one. Now this state, we're going to, I'm going to choose to call this modality images. 
what I want to do here, instead of presenting two text objects, I want to present two slide image objects. And these are the these are the objects that allow us to put images up. Another reason I wanted to do this task, uh, as I previewed earlier, was to illustrate some of the experiment resources we provide. This is where you specify what's the name of the file that you want to present. If you click on this folder icon here and go to resources, this is a set of graphic resources that get installed with ePrime <clears throat> that you can choose to use in your experiment if you want. We included a set of, of cards. <clears throat> um, the idea here is you might want to be doing this for some type of memory task, like the um, you know turn all the cards over and, and find your matching task. I'm going to go ahead and pick one here. The two of clubs. And apply that and hopefully you can see that that put the contents of that graphic file here. We're not going to hard code the images. We're not always going to present the two of clubs. We're going to present a different set of, of images, but I wanted you to see how we were actually getting access to those different images. Um, again, to save uh, you the agony of watching my poor typing, I'm going to go over here. I went ahead and predefined um, four different pairs of graphics cards I want to present. So I need to add to our list of trial exemplars because now we need to have an additional set of rows to present our images. So I just pasted in the names of the different image files that I want to use here. The modality for these is not going to be words, it's going to be images. And I followed the same pattern. I made the first two similar. In this case, the two and the three of clubs, <clears throat> the five of hearts and the five of diamonds, and then I made two that were more different. Two more things I need to change, and that's going to be it. As I said, I don't want to always show the two of clubs. I want to show whatever file name is in the stim1 attribute. This file name is telling eprime, go to the resources folder, go to the card subfolder. Now I'm going to say, then go and find whatever the value of the stim1 attribute is. And then add the PNG file extension because these files all have the same extension. I could certainly put the full file name, for example, 2-c.png as the name of my stimulus. <clears throat> Pardon me, I'm sorry. But since all of the graphics files I'm presenting have the same extension, there's no need to retype that consistently. It's just error prone and extra stuff to type. So this is illustrating that I can tell ePrime to go to a particular subfolder and then take the value, the attribute, and substitute it there. I also need to reposition my frame here. Just like we did the words, I want to make it uh, 25% on the left and 50% to get it in the middle. And you'll notice now we no longer see a specific graphics file. That's because ePrime doesn't know which graphics file you want to present. Now I'm going to make a second image object and do the same thing. Because I don't want to type, I'm going to go ahead and navigate here to get the folder structure. But then I'm going to replace, replace the file name with the attribute name for STEM2. Then I'll configure the frame. And once again, it'll be 75% and 50%. Notice I don't need to change anything about the duration input tab or the logging tab. That's the whole point of sharing these same slide objects, uh, presenting different states on the same slide. They're all tied to the same master parent slide object, and therefore all the logging already configured is, is ready to go. The last thing I need to do is tell ePrime what is the which of these two slide states am I going to present on any trial? Is it the words or is it the images? That's another reason why I wanted to encode this modality. It's the modality attribute that tells me that. So I can simply
set this active state property, which if you're only using a single state is blank and it defaults to the single state. Now I want to say pick whatever modality was selected on the trial. So now we can go ahead. We're going to run our experiment now. Make a new data file. Same instructions. Same set of four words that we saw previously. And now we're going to have four sets of images. And I'm just pressing ones and twos randomly. I finished my test. I'm going to take a look at this data file for this run, which I ran a subject 88. I want to go ahead and load my column definition file because I don't want to have to go ahead and retype it. And it applies the same column definition file. So now we can see that I had eight trials that were run as subject number 88. Four modality words, four images words, and these are the reaction times and the responses. And that's it. So let me go back and summarize some of the tips that I tried to illustrate in that brief presentation. First tip is to start with a template instead of starting with a blank experiment. It just saves you a lot of typing and it helps you get your structure in place. Secondly, take care with the names of your experiment objects. Don't just stick with the defaults. It's very easy to end up with an experiment with uh, five different text objects named text one, text two, text three, text four, text five. Um, not illustrative, doesn't help you understand how your experiment is structured and what the purpose of each of the objects are. We recommend testing your experiment in windowed mode. I didn't have a chance to illustrate this, but one reason we like to test in windowed mode is it makes it easy to terminate the experiment early. Oftentimes you go through a fairly fast cycle of tweak something on your display, change the color, change the board, or change the location. Then you just want to run it to see what that looks like, or you change something in your scoring, you want to check that it, that it works correctly, but you don't want to run all the 100 trials that you've programmed already. If you're running it in windowed mode, it's easier to terminate your experiment early. Also, check your data file and check it early in the process and take advantage of that column definition file. Last tip I forgot to do, don't forget to delete your items from, un from unreferenced. So let me go ahead and do that right now. I right clicked and say delete everything from unreferenced. And they're all gone. So I need to follow my own recommendations and delete those items. And lastly, I would like to strongly encourage everybody to contact PST support for assistance and contact us early in the process. We would much rather hear from you if you're struggling to fully understand how to implement your design. You can't figure out how this particular randomization might work, or you're just not sure how to put all the pieces together. We would much rather hear from you early and help walk you through. We'll do something very similar to what we did here. Break down your experiment into the smallest elements, put a basic piece of it in, test it, make sure it's working, and then we'll start adding complexity as we go. But that's much easier to do at the beginning than it is after you spent two weeks and you have sort of a mess because you've tried multiple different approaches and, and you can't see the forest for the trees. So we're we're very proud of our support department. We think it's a huge part of the service that we provide as part of this software publishing tool. And we we can't encourage you strongly enough to get in touch with us. I'm going to ask now for my uh, my colleagues to let me know if we have a queue of some questions um, that were submitted and if we want to go ahead and address them. While I'm asking them to go ahead and do that, I do want to mention that there are a variety of ePrime resources to help you. If you go to our support site, which is at http support.pstnet.com, 
One of the things you can access is our knowledge base article section. This is a variety of articles uh, on the very different various different software tools, software applications we have, eprime three versus eprime two. Also our Kronos product, which is a customized response collection, sound presentation, uh, and many other featured device. We also have a wide variety of experiment articles. In our experiment library, in our samples, and also in our step. The experiment library experiments are some standard paradigms that we'd encourage you to look at uh, to base your experiment on. For example, we have a Wisconsin card sort task. We have a uh, variety of memory tasks. We have a Posner priming task. Um, some survey experiments, things like that, a good place to start uh, if you're thinking more from a paradigm perspective. You know, what would the Wisconsin card sort look like in A-prime? The samples tend to be a little more clearly focused. If you have a particular randomization technique, for example, it will show you an example of how you could do that randomization, how to do your counterbalancing, for example, in a small sample experiment. Then lastly, the step experiments are a library that we're that was generated and collected by some colleagues of ours at Carnegie Mellon University. Brian McWinney was a researcher there who uh, incorporated E Prime into his teaching and collected a lot of his students' experiments. They've been very popular with, uh, with several people. So when Brian retired, he asked us if we would take over and host it there. So between these three resources, there's quite a variety of uh, sample experiments that you can go ahead and take a look at. So we have about eight minutes left. There was a question I see um, about if we can demonstrate, how would you present sound and images together at the same time? That's a terrific question. I'm sorry that I won't be able to demonstrate it to you live because again, unfortunately, I can't actually play the experiment and show the sound. But that's a terrific question and it illustrates one of the nice features of a slide in that you could present, put different pieces of information together. This icon here on the slide toolbar allows you to put up um, a sound presentation. So uh, I just clicked on that and, and clicked over here and that put up a slide object, uh, uh, sorry, a sound out object. Sound out this icon does not actually present on the screen. So in this case, I'm still going to present the two images I had. There's going to be a sound that plays. I'm not sure how well you can see this, but that sound icon is somewhat grayed out. So it represents to you the experimenter. This is the place that the sound's going to play. But there's not a visual element that's presented on the screen. And then very similar to what we did with the images, there is a file name property that says, what sound file do you want to play? Uh, we don't have as many um, sounds available as we do graphics images, but if we go down to our um, resources folder, we have a, a buzz, a click and a ding. So you could present, you could select the file that you wanted to present and put it there. And what will happen is at the same time that the slide presents the two, images, it's also going to play the sound. Now, one of the most common questions we get are a researcher envisions that I'm presenting sound and graphics images, but I want to vary the delay between them. Some cases I'm going to present them at the same time. Sometimes I'm going to present one before the other, and they try to put everything on one slide and build some type of delay into it. That's not how the sound out object on the slide is structured. That sound is going to play at the same time that the images are presented. So if instead you needed to prime your critical stimulus with a sound ahead of time, then you would manipulate your procedure to include that sound before your stimulus. So I grabbed a sound out object, it was an object that just presents sound. You could do a similar thing construct that to present your sound and then present your images, or um, just I just drag that down to move it in my procedure, you could present the sound afterwards. So I hope that answered the question about presenting sound together. I'm just gonna scrim some of the other uh, questions. Uh, there's a question about uh, 
any tips for writing inline scripts? So thank you for that question. That's a terrific question. I really, really glossed over this. There's quite a wide number of properties for all of these different objects in eStudio. Uh, and the goal is to allow you to work within the GUI to be able to um, implement all of the different design features of your experiment. However, there are many, many designs that, that can't be implemented just with E-Prime. That's why we have a programming language, a scripting language that allows you to customize the experiment. There are two places that you can add script to an experiment. One is uh, by dragging an inline object. When you open that up, that's just sort of a blank slate. And this is where you can start adding um, whatever script you need to incorporate. The other place you can add script is something called the user script tab. That allows you to define global variables that are used everywhere and global functions that are used everywhere. One of the most common examples of where you need to use inline script would be for some type of constrained randomization. We see this all the time. Yes, I want to present my stimuli randomly. However, I don't want the same stimulus to appear two trials in a row or within four trials. Or in, in this example we did here, I don't want to present three trials in a row that are text. I want to make sure that I'm mixing up more than that. That's a very common type of constrained randomization. So if you need to do something like that, how do you get started? Well, point number one is that the eBasic language is very similar to the Visual Basic language. It's structured like Visual Basic and has some a lot of commonalities with most standard programming languages. You can declare variables of different types. You can declare functions that calculate a value and return it. You can um, write conditional statements. If this case is true, then I want to do this. Uh, we have a variety of knowledge-based articles to walk you through the basics of how to work with eStudio, and we have a variety of sample experiments that incorporate a little bit of script, including the constrained randomization example that I just gave you. Um, I'm not going to try and pull those up right now at the last minute. Um, if you want more specific help, then please go ahead and shoot us a, an email or go ahead and take a look at our knowledge base to look at eBasic. In short, we're not going to be able to assist you and teach you the basics of programming. There's some fundamental concepts you need to understand, but we can point you to the resources that we have that review that information at a high level. What are the data types in our visual uh, in our eBasic language? What are the conditional statements? What are examples of using X, Y, and Z? So I hope that that information is helpful to you. That's a great question. Bear with me one moment. I'm going to see if there's a, an appropriate question we can ask one more time or get one more question in. Thank you, uh, Jordan. This is, the, this is the last question I'm going to take. I did not get into uh, the licensing model or um, how the different pieces of software get installed and utilized, but Jordan is asking, what's the best way to run an experiment when you've got multiple participants at once? So I'm assuming this is, uh, if you're asking about a typical scenario where you have a psychology uh, computer lab and you're bringing in five participants at the same time, um, I do want to stress that E-Prime experiments are designed to be run locally on an individual computer. So if you're lucky enough to have a dedicated psychology lab, you've got 20 computers, um, you could run up to 20 subjects simultaneously. Everything I did in this seminar, we were running from within the eStudio application. However, once your experiment is completely written and tested and you've confirmed that your data is there and you can access it all, you're ready to do your data collection. Uh, you don't need to install the full ePrime suite, which includes eStudio. E you can perform what we call a subject station installation that just installs the eRun application. You would then put your experiment, your compiled experiment, any resource files you're using, if you're presenting sounds or movies 
images or graphics, things like that. Uh, you would copy all of those to the local machine and have those experiments run on the local machine. Then you're going to have to go collect all of those individual data files. If your lab is networked, which most of them probably are, you could simply connect to the network, copy the individual data files to a shared folder. Uh, and then we didn't have a chance to look at this, but we have a utility that merges all your individual data files together. So if you ran 100 subjects, you'd have a single data file that you could run your analysis on. I hope that answered your question. If it didn't, again, please go ahead and contact us at support at pstnet.com. That hour went really fast for me. I know there were a few folks that had some additional questions that I'm sorry we didn't have time to get to. Um, but again, please feel free to, to, I can't say it enough, shoot us an email if your question didn't get answered. And, and if we didn't get to it, I apologize for that. I hope that was useful for you. And thank you so much for your time. Take care now.